Church at Glad Our God is fighting for you. He's on our side. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know about you, but I am overwhelmed by my God. His grace and His mercy. He's always been there for me. I love you, Jesus. Glorious God, you are the most glorious. 
Shout of praise, worship them. I delight myself in you. Come on. I delight myself. Come on, let's lift our hands and worship God. right now and tell him what it means to you. Just say something to him. Say, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I worship you, Lord. I worship you. I magnify you, Jesus. I'm overwhelmed. What a wonderful Father. You overwhelm us, Lord, with your presence, with your power, with your glory. God, I pray that you'll move in this service this morning. That you would saturate each and every heart, each and every life. Holy Spirit of God, would you irrigate down these aisles and in and out of these seats. And would you touch every man, every woman, every boy, every girl at the point of their need. May each and every one of us walk out of this place saying we've been overwhelmed by your presence. And our lives are forever changed because of it. Move, I pray, on every heart and every life. Thank you, Jesus. We ask it in your name. God's people said amen. amen. Just give someone next to you a big hug. Look them in the eye and say, I love you. You may be seated. <clears throat> How exciting it is to have you here today on this beautiful, beautiful, Spring. That's something to shout about right there. This beautiful spring morning. It's absolutely gorgeous. I love it. I love it. And uh, I'm glad you got up this morning. I'm glad you came to church. I'm glad you came to this church. I mean, if you're going to go to one, might as well just go to the best. <laughs> Amen. 
No, I want you to know that we're not in a competition with all the other churches. I mean, if we were, we would win, but we're not in a competition. I'm just teasing. We're all in this thing together. We're so glad that you're with us. I also want to welcome each and every person online. Those of you that are part of our online congregation. Yes, let them know we love them. And, and you're just as much a part of this service as, as those that have gathered in the building. And we're so glad you're just as much a part of our church. I want to encourage you that are a part of our congregation online. Invite somebody. To church. Now you can do that by inviting them to your home, have breakfast, gather around the computer, or you could just invite them to get on their computer or phone or whatever they watch on. In, anywhere in the world, just have them go to our website and and get and get get on and uh, watch watch the service. I was trying to think of what it, what what do you got to do to get on? Just hit the tab. What's it called? Log. Log on. I, it wouldn't come to me. You should have typed it on the screen. Help this technological He's dummy. Tech, tech savvy. I'm so tech savvy. But I want you to invite. <laughs> I want you to invite somebody uh, online. And it, again, it could be anybody in the world, any friend, family member. And I know that God will touch their heart and life. It's amazing to me how the Holy Spirit knows no bounds. What he does here, I've had so many people testify. They'll, they'll send a Facebook or just send an email to the church and say how God touched their heart and their life wherever they were. And I want, you to, I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is right where you are. He's going to help you and touch you and minister to you as well as those that are in the building. And then I want to say to you that are in the building, what, what a wonderful problem to have to be a part of a growing church. And, and the three amens confirm that we're a growing church. But God's doing some great things. Uh, as such, I mean, if you go out there this morning, you'll find the parking lot is jam-packed. And that's, that's a great problem to have, isn't it? Huh? And, uh, we've, we've got an overflow lot that people can use. And, and uh, that's, that's so exciting, uh, uh, you know, to be a part of a growing church. But, but as such, that, that poses a problem. Because if someone were to come late right now and pull into the parking lot, they would probably just drive on through and leave because they would think there's no room for them. And how many know we want to make room for everybody? Well, to do that, I'm going to ask you to, to consider something and pray about something. And I know that most of you are used to coming to the, to the 1030 service. And... Uh, it would be a tall order for me to ask you to do this, but I want you to consider, some of you, consider coming to the 845 service. Now, I know you have to get up a little bit earlier. I get that. And uh, I realize that you might have to drink a couple more cups of coffee. Three. But maybe, maybe three. But, uh, but if you could help us to make room for new people, because I know that new people want to come and experience our church and what God is doing here. And uh, we'll provide seats and parking for new people to come. Here we are going into spring, and that's when a lot of people will venture out and say, you know, we need to go to church. And some of them will say, you know that guy we've been watching on TV? Let's, let's, let's try that church. And, uh, you know, amen. Now, those of you that are faithful to the church, you'll drive around, find a place to park in the grass, or you'll go down there in the... Gravel, you even stand. Some of you love my preaching so much, you would stand the whole time just to listen to me preach. While others can't even stand my preaching. <laughs> but uh, a new person, they're not going to do that. They're, they're going to drive through and leave. And we don't want that, do we? So why don't you pray about, here we are going in the spring, coming to the 845 service. I would greatly appreciate it. It would be a great help. I'll be there. I'm in all services. And uh, I, I'll look for you then. We have a great crowd. We had a great crowd in the 845 service this morning. But there's still more room in that service. And we're running out of room in this one. And uh, so I can tell you're excited about that. You pray about it. Think about it. And consider it. Really consider it. And, man, if, if you're late to this service, I can't imagine how late you'd be to that. <laughs> but, uh, 
As long as you get here by the preaching, you're, you're good. I'm just teasing. As long as you get here by the offering. <laughs> Ushers, I want you to get in place. Speaking of which, ushers, get in place. Those of you online, you can give right where you are. Just hit the tab there and, and give and be a part of this service and your worship and giving as well. And we would appreciate that. Father, I pray that you'll bless this offering. Multiply it and use it for your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Today at 4.30, there is a connection meeting. Uh, that is for everybody that, that calls Life Change Church your church. So be here today at 4.30. Pastor's going to be sharing some things uh, right here in the sanctuary. So be here at 4.30 today for connection meeting. Then let me ask, how many of you have a smartphone? Every, about everybody has a smartphone these days. In fact, they, they say that by the end of this year, 16 billion people all over the world will have a smartphone that you can take a picture with. Here's what we're asking you to do. We're calling this the Invite Challenge. You know Easter is coming up uh, April 5th. We're just a couple weeks away from Easter. April 5th, we have services 845 and 1030 on April 5th, Easter Sunday. Here's what we want you to do. Take your phone and turn around like you're going to do a video selfie and invite people, video yourself inviting people to come to church on Easter Sunday April 5th, 845 and 1030. And then it's that easy. And once you're done, then upload it to Facebook. Uh, you can up tweet it out. You can send it out in a text message to all, your, all the people in your contacts. Invite, invite, invite. And this is a fun way to do it. So you can make it as easy as you want, or you can make it a little more creative. I got a exa couple examples here for you. Easter Sunday is coming up on April 5th, and we want to invite you to our Easter Sunday services at Life Change Church in Batavia, Ohio. Services that morning will be at 8.45 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. We hope to see you there. Bye. Bye. That's an easy one. Here's one a little more creative. Who's going to invite? Oh, perfect. Hey, JJ, you got any big plans for Easter Sunday? If not, you should come check out Life Change Church. Mm, what time? Church is usually pretty boring. Dude, it is not boring. We got a service at 8.45 and 10.30. And if you show up, our organist might just break it down like this. <laughs> Hey, just, just a second. I, I think I would pay a mission to see that, wouldn't you? <laughs> Poor Edwin. I didn't have any part in that, Edwin. Nothing at all to do with that, let me just say. So use your smartphone, video yourself. If you want to do your family, uh, inviting people to come. If you want to do it in your community groups and get your community group together and, 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 and post something, uh, a welcome, an invite to our Easter services, do that. Get involved with that. We'll be pushing it on Facebook and tweet, tw Twitter as well. So uh, uh, get involved with that, if you will. All right, here's some other notes. Hi, my name is Michelle Oakley, and I am so excited to share with you about the new Access Group here at Life Change Church.
Embrace Grace was created for the sole purpose of providing emotional, spiritual, and practical support for young women who have found themselves in an unintended, unplanned pregnancy. If the body of Christ would come together and show them unconditional love and support, we could possibly change the course of their life and their unborn baby's life forever. That instead of choosing abortion, they would choose life. If you think that you would benefit from this or anyone you know, then please join us at the interest meeting March 20th at 7 p.m. at the church. Hope to see you there. And one other announcement, remember our Easter egg hunt is coming up um, here in just a couple weeks, and then uh, we need uh, you to help us by bringing Easter eggs in uh, by next Sunday. Next Sunday, help us out with that. Don't you love Jesus? I love to worship him. I love to bless him. He's so awesome. Thank you for salvation, Father. Thank you for loving us.
I want you to turn with me to Psalm 11. We're going to read one verse, one verse only, Psalm 11, verse 3. Would you stand, please, and let us reverence the Word of God as it is read in our hearing. Psalm <clears throat> chapter 11 and verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? We're preaching in regards to foundations. Last Sunday we began. Today we're going to continue with this message, foundations. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word that is going to speak to each and every one of our lives and hearts. And I pray that each of us will have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. And that we would open ourselves up and allow your word to be embedded deep within our heart and spirit. I ask God for an unction and anointing of the Holy Ghost that I recognize and realize I need. Calm my nerves. Settle my thoughts. Help me to hear your voice so that I can speak to this, your people. And may your word guide our lives and change us forever. And we'll ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> the psalmist asked this powerful and poignant question. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? I think that you can see there has been an onslaught of hell against the foundations, the fabric of our lives, the foundations of our churches, and the foundation of our culture, it has been absolutely under attack, and I don't have to make a case for that. Open your eyes, and you can clearly see they have been rotting at the core. If the foundations be destroyed, what can we do? The obvious answer is this. Rebuild them. Relay the foundations. Build the pillars again. The Apostle Paul tells us in Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13, there are three main foundational pillars. He said, these things abide. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these, love. Last Sunday we dealt with faith, that we need to rebuild the foundation of faith in our lives, in our church, in our culture. Today, I want to deal with hope, that we need to rebuild the foundation of hope. If there were ever a time where people seem more hopeless than ever before, yeah. it is now. Right. Hopelessness prevails and pervades in our world, in our culture, in our society, in our own lives. People feel absolutely hopeless. The suicide rate is at an all-time high. The swell of emptiness in people's lives is unprecedented, to say the least. Hopelessness. But we need to be reminded that the Bible and the message of the Bible and salvation is a message of hope. All throughout the Bible, there's so much we could talk about. There are so many verses that I could pull out and talk about hope. I'm reminded of one in Romans chapter 5 where Paul said that hope makes us not ashamed. I want to tell you this morning, because of the hope that I've got in my heart and in my life, I am not ashamed. What do you mean? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed to say that I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed to tell you this morning that I am born again of God's Spirit. I'm not ashamed to tell you I've been twice born and Spirit baptized. That my sins have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ and my name is written down in heaven. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God and the salvation. I am not ashamed. Of Jesus 
I'm reminded of the old song. I can hear A.B. Malloy singing it right now. I'm not ashamed to speak for Jesus, my dear Lord. I'm not ashamed to praise his name. I'm not ashamed to hold his blessing. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm not ashamed. And I want to tell you this morning, because of the hope that I have in my life, I am not ashamed of Jesus. But let me give you something today. Because the Bible is clear. As a matter of fact, there is a theme in the Word of God of hope. That you can boil this thing down all the way down to the bedrock of hope for the Christian. There is a, there's a, there's a predominant theme in the Word of God. A doctrine that we can stand on. A foundational truth that we can take all the way into eternity. I'm talking about more than anything else in the Bible. It is this truth. That is to give hope to the Christian more than anything else. You know what that is? The second coming of Jesus Christ. The coming of Christ. The truth. The bedrock reality that we can rest ourselves upon. And have hope for tomorrow is the fact that we know and believe that the same Jesus that came and was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The same one that came and opened blinded eyes and unstopped deaf ears and caused lame legs to leap with joy. Even raised the dead. That same Jesus that died and rose again from the dead and went back and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. That same Jesus is going to come back to this earth. He is coming back. That is our hope. Listen to me. Faith can only be used in the present. Hope is all about what's going to happen. The hope that we have is that Christ will return. I find it very interesting. When you read throughout the Old Testament, you'll find that the Old Testament prophet, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Nahum, Habakkuk, you could name them all, all of them. They, it's amazing how they clearly spelled out and outlined Jesus' first coming when he came, was born in Bethlehem, his flight into Egypt. I mean to tell you, they, they dotted every I and crossed every T. They got it right down to the letter how Jesus would come the first time. And you know what I find it very interesting is? Those same prophets that prophesied his first coming and got it right are the same ones that also prophesied his second coming. And isn't it interesting that they prophesied his second coming 50 times more than his first? Do you know why? Oh my, all throughout there, there were time and time and time again that Israel would be in captivity, perhaps by Babylonian captivity, enslaved, or they were down, they were going through the depths of something, they were in the valley, they were in a darkness, and one of the prophets would hear from God, and they would stand and speak, and they would say, this is not always going to be this way, Christ is going to come, and the government will be upon his shoulders, he's going to lead and rule and reign forever, and they would time and time and time again bring what was a message of hope to his people yes. God's people by saying Christ will come Amen. Amen. did you realize that one in every 25 verses in the New Testament deal with the second coming of Christ let me say that again one in every 25 verses all throughout the whole New Testament talks of Jesus coming back why? A message of hope. Christ himself said, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. It was a message of hope. I'm going to make a startling start powerful statement, but I'm not going to back up from it. You hear me? If the second coming of Christ does not bring hope to your heart, you're not saved. 
Let me just lay it out here. If the return of Christ does not bring hope inside, it doesn't excite you and bring hope to your heart, then you're not right with God. You say, that you're being judgmental. No, I'm being truthful. Because it is all about hope. Remember what Paul said? He said to Titus that we are looking for that blessed hope, the return of Jesus Christ. The word blessed there means happy. In other words, our happy hope is that Jesus Christ is going to come back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If the coming of Christ doesn't make you happy, then you need to get saved. I'm not trying to be mean. Let's just be real. Now, I got to tell you, I can remember a day, even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you preach about the second coming of Jesus Christ, and you would almost have to stop preaching people shouting about it. The, the problem is we're so well fixed with this world, we're not even concerned about the next one. Hmm? But hope is that Christ will come. Listen to me. Why is this such a message of hope? I could go all through the Bible, all through the New Testament. I'm going to give you a couple of things, just two things. I only have two points. Last Sunday, I preached entirely too long. And I'm going to remedy it this Sunday. Instead of having three points, I'm going to have two points. Listen to the nervous laughs. He will come to fight. I want you to think about the condition of our world right now. We think everything's all right. Just turn on the news. Let's talk about the condition of our world. Maybe you've heard of this. The blood moons. I don't have time to talk about them in great detail. But every one of these eclipses that's happening with the moon, every one of them right now, they're happening on Jewish feasts. Every time this happens in history, something major happens in the earth. Do you hear me? We're in the midst of it right now. We're just about to have another blood moon. I don't have time to even go into it. Maybe another time I will. How about Netanyahu's speech recently? You hear me? I want to tell you something. If you'll just let me, I'm getting ready to preach in just a minute. And I don't know if you've stumbled in here and don't know what kind of church this is. We're a gospel preaching church. I'm getting ready to lay it down. I'm getting ready to shut the corn, children. You hear me? I'm going to draw the blade. I'm going to cut it all the way down to the morrow if you just let me in just a minute. Netanyahu stands in front of the world, in front of Congress, in a camera that shoots it all the way around the world, and he's saying to his people, come home. I'm calling my people home to Jerusalem. Come home. Do you understand that that is prophecy being fulfilled in front of your very eyes? The Bible says in the last days they will come from the north and the south and the east and west and every nation that God's chosen people, the elect of Israel, they will come and come back to their homeland. He's calling them home. Why? Because we are living in the final waning moments of, of history right now. That's exciting. I said that's exciting. Jesus said when these things happen, don't look down. Look up. Oh, I feel this. Look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. He said, come home. It's happening in our world right now. Need we, need we talk about ISIS? Huh? Taking their butcher knives and hacking off the heads of someone that's a Jew or a Christian? Ishmael will always hate Isaac. You hear me? It's a 4,000 year old problem. Destroying ancient Bible artifacts because of their disdain and hatred for anything that resembles Jesus Christ. Do you hear me? 
Not to mention the Iranian nuclear yeah. talks. We are this close. Listen, we're that close to Iran having nuclear power. I, I just got... The Bible says in the last days we'll profess ourselves to be wise and become fools. I, I just got to be honest. If my neighbor hated me so much he wanted to kill me, I'm not going to load a 12-gauge and hand it to him. I'm going to load the 12 gauge and keep it myself. Do you hear me? This is not rocket science. Are you a moron? Huh? You say you're going to draw attention to yourself. I'm not trying to draw attention to myself. I'm saying it's happening right in front of our eyes. We're that close to, to the enemies of this, of anything that resembles. The, the Jews or Christianity, they, they want to wipe us off of the map. And we're going to give them something that could possibly do it? Then we've got the U.S. peace talks. Now, let me tell you something. There may be a little span of time when there's going to be peace in the Middle East, but only a little span of time, the Bible says. It's going to set the stage for the Antichrist. And I don't have time to get into all that. But I want to tell you something. The Bible is very clear and it's exciting to me because we see it happening. Right now before your very eyes. Now I'm going to preach. Right now before your very eyes. The Bible says that the nations of this earth and the armies of this world are going to array themselves against God's people Israel. They're going to form themselves and come against every single army. Every single nation will array themselves against Israel. Then you know what's going to happen? Let me tell you what's going to happen according to the Bible. About that time, and let me just say it how I want to say it. About that time, Jesus Christ is going to stretch his long Galilean leg across the White Sea. And down Amen Avenue he'll go. And across Hallelujah Street. And through the Eastern Gate. And shrouded in all the glories of heaven. Jesus Christ will ride out of heaven. And the armies of the Lord. And the armies of the Lord. Hallelujah. They're going to come. Christ will put one foot in the Kindron Valley. One on the Mount of Olives. Pull the sword from the sheath. And he will fight. He will fight. He will fight for Israel. And the Bible says the blood will run to the bridle of the horse's mouth. He will fight for God's chosen people. I want you to listen to me. God made a promise to Abraham. God made a promise to Abraham 4,000 years ago. And he will keep his word. Not one letter will fall to the earth and die. But God will fight for his chosen people. The Jewish people. The Israeli nation. And he will win. Hey! He will win. He is king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. I'm glad I'm one of them. I'm glad I'm with him. I've cast my lot on his side. I'll say hallelujah. I'm on the winning side this morning. Say you lost your mind. No, I haven't lost my mind. I'm right on target right now. Now listen to me. I am not a replacement theologian. There are those who say the church replaced Israel. No. No, sir. They are his chosen. Now what the Bible does say in Romans, we have been grafted into the family. This morning I am of the seed of Abraham. I am of the household of David. And Christ himself will walk upon that throne and sit down and rule and reign for all eternity. The coming of Christ is what I'm trying to explain to you. The coming of Christ is the hope of all the earth. He will come and fight. 
I'll set that down in case I start preaching again in a minute. He will come and fight. Hope to the world. What man could not do in bringing peace, he will come, the prince of peace, and rule and reign in peace and in justice. The government shall be on his shoulders, according to Isaiah. Do you hear me? Let me deal with this. He's going to come not only to fight, but he brings hope because he's going to come and free us. Now, what do you mean? I mean, let's bring it right down to home here. What I mean is the coming of Christ is the completion of the redemptive plan of God. Hmm? Christ redeemed us, according to the Bible. He is redeeming us, and he will redeem us. He redeemed us. That's saving us from the penalty of sin. He's redeeming us. That's saving us on a daily basis from the principle of sin. That guiding rule inside. He's sanctifying us, as the the biblical term would be. There's a sanctifying act, a work of God's grace, a baptism in his spirit, but that's not the end all. That's just the beginning of his sanctifying. Amen. He's, he's delivering us, redeeming us daily, and he will redeem us. Do you understand what I mean by that? The body is not redeemed. We are still in the presence of sin every day, and we still deal with the corruptiveness of sin in our body that we are living in a fallen corrupt world the the coming of christ is the redemption of the earth and the body and the body the, the this isn't redeemed yet if you don't believe me then just take a picture out of yourself from 20 20 years ago and now look in the mirror hmm? your body's corrupting and now all you got to do is see the Black hair turning gray and the wrinkles in your face. Hmm? The body's not redeemed. He's going to come and deliver us, first of all, from the presence of sin. Have you you ever considered that? What's it going to be like to live in a world where there's no sin? Everybody look at me. The problems that you've dealt with in this life, the sins that, that got a hold of you and destroyed your life for so, many, so, so long. Even though you get delivered from it and he forgives you of it, you still every day have to deal with it, the temptation of it. Hmm? The alcoholic, God sets them free, but every day they got to drive by a bar. Hmm? The drug addict gets set free, but every day they got to... I mean, we constantly have to deal with temptation because of sin in this earth. Just turn the TV on. Get your phone. I mean, it's so. I, I want to tell you, if the Apostle Paul was plopped down in this world right now, he would say, I don't know how anybody's going to make it. <laughs> he didn't deal with anything like that. Not near this kind of thing. Someone gave me a little Jesus thing. It's a, you know, the, the kind that you look at it, it just looks like lines, but then you look at it again and you see Jesus' name. Well, we set it on the mantle, and above the mantle was a television. Right underneath, it's just right underneath the TV. Now, Mandy was making breakfast for her basketball team yesterday, and it was right, and we were all in there, and, and I looked over and saw that Jesus thing right under the TV. I said to someone, I said, we try to keep Jesus right underneath the TV. And they said, why? I said, well, it's hard to watch trash and look at Jesus at the same time. <laughs> Honestly, I put it there for Mandy. <laughs> Just teasing. We deal with this every day, sin all around us. But one day Jesus is going to come, and when he comes, he's going to redeem the earth. There will be no more sin. That's hope. Never tempted again. Never fall again. 
Never fall prey to it again. Never sin again. Never have to worry about it again. I mean, it's gone forever. He will, he will wipe the earth clean of sin and unrighteousness. That's hope. But then he's going to come and redeem the body. In other words, sickness. There's coming a day we have hope because there'll, there'll be no more getting old. There'll be no more. We use a lot of healing scriptures out of context. For example, he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Now we'll use that when we're praying for someone to be healed. And don't misunderstand me. I believe God heals people. But the redemptive plan of God is not ultimate healing in this life. The body's not redeemed yet. You understand. Let me ask you. Can I just ask everybody a question real quick? Do you know anybody that's died? Anybody? Do you know anyone that... Come on, it's not a trick question. Everybody dies. Do you know anyone that's died? Hmm? I knew people that got healed and then later died. I know a man in the Bible that was dead in the grave four days and Jesus raised him up, Lazarus, and he still died. Right. Healing is not a matter of if, it's only a matter of when. It's a part of God's redeeming plan. It's just, it's just sometimes he heals a little bit right now to give us a picture of what it's going to be. But ultimately, he's going to come and wipe it clean. There'll be no sickness. That's hope. That's hope that one day they'll never walk in and give you a bad report and say, I'm sorry you have cancer. That's hope that one day they'll never come in and say, I'm sorry, but only a percentage of your heart is working. That's hope that one day Jesus Christ is going to come and you'll not see anybody going around in a wheelchair. I'm trying to explain to you he's going to redeem the body. We have a hope, a hope. I mentioned this, and I'm going to say it right now, and I'm going to preach a little bit more, and then I'm going to let you go. But I want, I want to mention this right now in this service. The message of salvation. Everybody look at me and listen to me closely. I want to teach you something now. The message of salvation is one of hope, not help. Let me say that again, because we've messed it up. The message of salvation is one of hope, not help. I want you to look at Jesus on the cross. There are two men beside him, two thieves. One of them wanted help. If you're the son of God, then get us down from here. Help me right now. Do something for me right now. Help me, Jesus. The other guy said, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus said, today you're going to be in paradise with me. One was hope. The other just wanted help. We have filled the pulpits in America with a help gospel, not a hope gospel. Do you hear me? We're going to help you get this, and we're going to help you with your bills, and we're going to help. And there's nothing wrong with getting help. When you get the message of hope, it'll help you every day. And the Bible will help you, but the message of salvation is not one I'm going to help you right now and get you by for another day in this world. No, the message of salvation is, I want to tell you, you're going to make it through this old mess one of these days. One of these days, you're not going to deal with sin anymore. Someday, sickness is never going to enter your body. One of these days, you're not going to have to worry about death. You're not going to have to worry about fighting with one another. You're not going to have to worry about the trouble and trial and heartache and disappointment in this life. You're not going to hear the bad reports. You're not going to have sorrow and pain and... One of these days I'm going to come back and I'm going to rise with healing in my wings. And I'm going to bring health and vitality and strength. And I say glory to God. I'm talking about hope. That's salvation. Can I just preach the Bible to you? I've stood there. 10,000 times. That's an exaggeration, but it feels like it. You can tell the difference of someone that just wanted some help, someone that got hope when they're laying on their deathbed. I dealt with a man 
for two years in the church that I pastored. He never missed a Sunday. He had cancer. Never missed one Sunday of service. Listen to me. And in that church, we had a healing line every Sunday morning. Just come forward. We're going to pray for God to touch you. And that man, every Sunday for two years, came to that healing line. Not correct, not saved. Never confessed Christ. Not yet. Every Sunday, he came forward and asked me to pray that God would heal his body. He wanted help. The last Sunday I ever talked to him personally, he came forward in that healing line. And I looked at him and I said, let me ask you a question. You come every week. You're more faithful than the church people. I mean, he was more faithful than the Christians in that church. He never missed asking God to help him heal his body. I said, let me ask you a question. What if God doesn't heal your body? Then, what then? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, if God doesn't heal your body, what's going to happen then? He said, I'm going to die. And I said, what then? He said, according to your Bible you've been preaching, I'm going to stand before God in judgment. I said, what then? He's going, to, he's going to say, depart. I said, you're going to go to hell. We don't like to talk about this stuff. Do we? But that's the reality. I said, buddy, you better get right with God and get some hope about you. Maybe God will heal your body. Maybe he won't. But when you die, at least you know that one day Jesus Christ is going to come back. You hear what I'm telling you? And right there at the altar, he began to weep and the Holy Ghost got a hold of his heart and he began to shake uncontrollably and under conviction and we prayed and I said, you pray this prayer and he asked Jesus Christ to forgive him of his sin. He said, come into my heart, come into my life. I'm sorry that I wronged you. I want hope. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He prayed at that altar and Jesus Christ came into his heart and saved him. Two months later, he died and went to heaven and one these days Christ is going to come back what let me ask you a question what kind of preacher would I be if I just help you and don't give you hope what kind of man would I be if I help you today but you stand before God unsaved not right and go to hell what kind of man would I be I would not be a very good man this morning I may not be helping you a whole lot with your finances I may not be helping wrapping you up in an Armani suit. Maybe I'm not teaching you how to drive a Cadillac. I may not be helping you with other defining things in your life this morning. But one thing I'll give you, I'll give you a hope that if you'll put faith in Jesus Christ, you'll know that you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that when he comes, you're going to heaven. And if you die today, you'll know that one day you'll wake up with him and you hear me. That's what we need. Hope. Get all the help in the world and go to hell. Huh? Well, I'll tell you, this is old-fashioned, isn't it? There's still room. We've got enough of the help gospel out there. We need a hope gospel. We've got enough of the help you with every day. Have your best life now. Well, I may not have my best life now, but I'll give you something for eternity. Huh? I don't want you to drive that thing all the way to hell. I'm trying to give you hope. I've stood there a thousand times. They will around. And it's a whole different feeling when someone's laying in that casket. Let's put faith in Jesus. That's why Paul said we don't mourn as others mourn. We have a hope in our cry. Hope. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about my mama. You know, just recently we buried her. And, uh, we, she was at the hospital and they called me. My sister did frantic. Mom, mom just died. I said, I'm getting in the car. And I took off toward the hospital. When I got there, she was alive. And man, she was fit to be tied. She got carnal about it. Almost had to get, get her saved right there. Again. <laughs> she, I, she was upset, wasn't she, man? She was mad. She let that doctor have it. She was letting him have it. How dare you? We were clear to not resuscitate. 
You brought me back. How dare you do that to me, she said. I was ready to go. I wanted to go on to heaven, and you brought me back. How dare you? I'll never forget it as long as I live. We got in that family room, all the family, all the, all the siblings. We got in that family room, and the doctor came in. I should look on his face, bowed head. He looked up and said, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> what for? He said, I'm so sorry that I brought her back. Will you please forgive me? Yeah. He walked out of there and I said to Mandy, I said, I guarantee you he ain't never walked in that situation. He's walked in that family room a thousand times and said, oh, I'm so sorry we lost them and couldn't do anything about it. I'm so sorry that they died. And here he walked in and said, I'm so sorry that we brought her back. He has never been in that situation before, probably never again, I don't know. What I'm talking about is my mother said I'm sick of it all. I'm done with this old world. I've dealt with diabetes and God hadn't seen fit to heal me, but they've cut all my toes off. I can remember I'd go home and she'd say, oh, sure, and she'd just weep. You know why she was crying? Because diabetes had eat her eyes up and she couldn't see anymore, hardly barely see anything. She said she was so upset she would weep profusely. I said, what's wrong, Mama? She said, I can't read my Bible anymore. I used to read my Bible every day and I can't read it anymore. I'm so tired. I just don't want to be here anymore. Troy, will you pray? Last conversation I ever had with her, she said, Honey, would, Troy, will you just pray that God will take me? I'm tired of living in this old world. I've dealt with the pain too long, the heartache too long. I've been through all that I could possibly go through. I'm just ready to get out of here. I'm trying to explain to you hope. This is salvation. Hope. 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 Our blessed hope. We planted her in the earth just a few months ago, but one of these days, the Bible says the trumpet of God is going to sound, and the eastern sky is going to roll back, and the Son of God is going to return to this earth, and the dead, the dead in Christ shall rise. I say hallelujah. The dead in Christ shall rise. Oh, glory to God. That grave is going to burst open like an eggshell. And when my mama comes out, she's going to have all of her toes. She's going to have her eyes. She's going to have health and vitality in her body. I want to tell you, she will be healed from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet. No more pain. No more sickness. No more tears. No more death. It will all be gone. Hope. I say glory to God. Hallelujah to the Lord. You say, why would you shout like that? Why would I shout like this? Why wouldn't I shout like this? Are you, have you lost your mind? People shout over a bunch of foolishness. I'm shouting over something real. Huh? We get carried away over a bunch of foolishness. You get more excited about a new car and it's just going to rust. I want to tell you, I'm talking about going to a place. There'll be no rust. This corrupt will put on incorruption. This moral immortality. Why would I shout like this? This corrupt will put on incorruption. This moral immortality. And it'll be brought to pass the same. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? I want to tell you, Jesus Christ died, rose again from the dead, and he's coming back in a glorified body. And everybody that's put their faith in him, they're going to have a glorified body. No more sickness, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, no more graveyards, no more cemeteries. Do you hear me? Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Whoop, glory. The sorrow of this life is past. The disappointment of this world is gone. Huh? I'm going to heaven. I'm going there when I die. I'm going to heaven in the sweet, sweet by and by. Angels place my order for a mansion and a crown. And in that book up yonder, just write my full name down. There 
awaits for me a glad tomorrow where gates of pearl swing open wide. And when I cross this veil of sorrow, I'll pull up on the other side. Someday, beyond the reach of mortal kin. Someday, God only knows just where and when the wheels of life, they're going to come to a standstill. And Christ is going to come. He's going to right all the wrongs. He's going to make the crooked straight. He's going to give us all that he promised to give us. All the promises will be yes and amen. They might be hid in Christ right now, but one day the veil is going to be pulled back. The clouds are going to roll asunder. Hey, the valley's going to open up. The river's going to open up. We're going to make our way into that glorious city, God's city. I say hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I'm about to preach myself happy. Said I'm about to preach myself happy. Huh? This short beast the drug somebody took last night. This short beast the bottom of the bottle somebody saw last night. Hey, I want to tell you. I'm talking about hope. I've got to quit. He'll give me three more minutes, five more minutes. Thank you. I want you to see him. Adam and Eve fell. There's that tree. The tree of life. God said, I've got to protect the way of the tree of life. He put the cherubs around it. They surrounded flaming swords. And they stood around and cast them out of the garden. You say that was God's judgment. No, that was God's mercy. If, they, if, they would, if mankind would have eaten that tree of life, in the condition of sin, then we would have been locked in sin and de destined for hell. No man would have been saved. He said, I'm going to protect the way of the tree of life. But I want to show you something. You go all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. <laughs> Glory to God, Chris. You go all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, and you're going to find that the gate opens up. And the born again and spirit baptized believers in Jesus Christ those who have come through the blood of the lamb those who are his children he's going to fold those wings back the angels are going to drop those flaming swords back in the sheath and they're going to step out of the way and he said they're going to come from every corner of the earth the north the south and the east and the west every tribe every kindred every kind and every tongue it's for the healing of all the nations and they're going to make their way down the streets of gold and walk across this crystal sea and grab a hold of a fruit hey a fruit and take a bite of that and it'll heal everything that ever ailed us He'll touch our heart and life from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet and inside and out. It'll lock us in, seal us in the righteousness of Christ for all eternity. And I'll be cast in his image, a body glorified that will live forever and forever and forever. I'm talking about hope. I've got to quit. Glory to God. I don't know what in the world I got myself into today. You got yourself into the right thing. Huh? We need to relay, rebuild the pillar of hope in the church. Not this false, pseudo, temporal, worldly. Huh? I hope I have a better tomorrow. When I wake up in the morning, and I'm, I, listen, I'm all for God blessing us and all the rest of it. But I want to tell you something. There's been some people that lived in a prison cell till they died for the faith. There's been some people that God never healed. I've got to quit Fanny Crosby, precious saint of God, songwriter, song, wrote Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heard salvation, purchase of God. Born of the Spirit, washed in his blood. She wrote so many wonderful songs. I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him by the prince of the nails in his hands. I mean, she wrote so many wonderful songs. She was born blind. Had been blind, never seen anything. Never seen a beautiful sunset. Never stood and watched the swelling of the deep. Rolling, crashing into the rocks. 
never gazed upon the face of a newborn beautiful baby. Someone said to her one time, they said, it must have been an awful trial living your whole life having never seen. And God never touched you to see. It must have been an awful thing. And she said, oh, no, oh, no. I'm considering being blind my whole life. The most wonderful blessing anyone could have. And they said, how in the world could you do that? She said, well, I look at it this way. The first face I'll ever see. will be the face of my Savior. She, she knew a gospel of hope, not of help. I don't care what you go through in this world. <laughs> we have hope that all the right, all the wrong will be made right on that day. I've preached too long. Stand with me, please. Let's relay this foundation and have hope. Maybe, here, maybe you're here today and you say, Preacher, I don't have the hope you're talking about. I, I don't know Jesus. I'm unsaved. If I died or he came back, I don't know that I'm ready. I don't care how long you've gone to church or what church you've gone to. If you don't know in your heart you have the hope that I'm talking about, I would, if I were you, I would run to this altar. Will you sing just as I am? That's what I want you to sing. Go to the key of C, I believe it is. If you're here today and you don't know, you don't know this hope, I'm going to ask you to do something real brave and real bold. It better be worth every step. I'm going to ask you to step out of your seat and come and kneel right here at the front of this building at this altar. And we're going to pray with you and introduce you to Jesus. Why don't you come as they sing? Sing it with the congregation. I am with one plea. How about it today? Time is short. God bless your heart, young lady. Somebody else. And that thou meet me. Come of the Spirit of God. How about you today? Sing it again. Just as How about I it today? Do you have this hope I'm talking about? Come and find it. Come and find it. Before we go, let's bow our heads and close our eyes, please. I wonder if there's someone would say, Preacher, you're a little wild. I'm not sure. <laughs> I just preach this way. I get wound up. But I love you. I just wonder if you would say, Today, I don't have the hope you're talking about. I don't know Jesus. And I need prayer. No one's looking but me and the Lord. Who would just slip your hand up and say, Will you pray for me that I'll find what you're talking about before it's too late? Just slip your hand up. Anybody like that in this building? I need Jesus. I see that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand. God bless you. Somebody else, pray for me. That hand, that hand. Amen. Pray for me. Just a moment longer. Pray for me. I need. Amen. I see that over to my right. God bless you. Somebody else. Amen. Way in the back. God bless you. I need what you're talking about. No one's looking but me and the Lord. You may take them down. Anybody else? Amen. God bless you. Somebody else. Amen. God bless your heart. I see that. Somebody else. God bless you. Yes. Way in the back. God bless you. Father, I thank you for every person that's here. You've seen every hand that was raised. I pray for them now. 
I pray, God, that you'll move in their heart and in their life by your sovereign grace. Touch them. Draw them. You are doing it. That's, they're admitting that you're speaking to their heart. And I pray that you'll give them the courage to take the steps they need to take and ask you to come in their heart and in their life. And Lord, we're going to sing one more verse. Maybe they would have the courage to do it today. But they would step out of their seat and publicly say, I confess Christ as my Savior. Help them to do it in Jesus' name. Go ahead and sing one more verse, and that's it. Why don't you come? I am Someone at the computer, Chris, grab one of those boys right there and put that number up there. Everyone look at the screen, please. I want to put this text number up here. That number right there. If you raise your hand, you would say, I want someone this week to pray with me. I want you to text this number right now. And someone's going to reach out to you and pray with you. And they're going to lead you in what you need to do. I know you didn't come now, but I want to tell you, you can get saved anywhere. Amen? You can get saved anywhere. But I want you to take one more step. All these smartphones we got, you know how to text. If you don't know how to text, then find someone that knows how to text. But you text this number. Give me your name. Tell me you need Christ and would like for someone to pray with you. And someone's going to reach out to you this week. Will you do that? There it is. Amen. Give me the key of G. Two things. Won't you let these people know they made the best choice they could have made? Now, I, you gotta, you got to help me get the beat, all right? Everyone, you got to watch me. Everyone do this. Are you there? Stay right there. Yes, our Lord is coming back to earth again. Oh, you guys are off deep. Satan will be bound a thousand years. We'll have no tempter then. After Jesus shall come back to earth again. Sing it now. Oh, our Lord is coming back to earth again. You're dismissed. God bless you. Yes, our Lord is coming back to earth again. Satan will be bound a thousand years will have no take today. After Jesus shall come back to earth.